Welcome to Courtside Moms. I'm your host, Wendy Sparks. And I'm Stephanie Fullhand. Today, we have the utmost pleasure of speaking with Danielle LaForce, the mother of Terrence Mann of the L.A. Clippers. Dania was previously a NCAA player for the Georgetown Hoyas women's basketball team, as well as Division I and II coach. Welcome, Dania, to our show. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Wendy. It's a pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure to have you here. So, Dania, you have such a vast background and a basketball career. So let's start by with you, and how did this all start? Uh, I started playing basketball in eighth grade, which is pretty late. Most uh, most kids start playing, you know, CYO ball or early bitty ball pretty early. And I started pretty late, which was different. So I didn't know much about the game. Um, the, my only introduction to the game was actually watching my dad watch the Georgetown Hoyas play. And at the time, mm-hmm. Patrick Ewan was on the team. So I was a you know young girl watching my father get all excited about the Georgetown Hoyers and college basketball. And I would sit and watch the games with him and he tried to explain the game to me. So that was really my first introduction to the game of basketball. When I was approached to play basketball, it was at my um, Girl Scout graduation. I was graduating from being a junior to I think, uh, I think it was a cadet after the next round after. And my troop leader sister was the local basketball coach. And she said to her sister, this girl is tall. Does she even play basketball? And uh, my troop leader said, nope, she doesn't play basketball. So after the graduation, my troop leader's sister approached me and she said, hey, you know, do you want to play basketball? You're pretty tall. You know, I think you'll be great. So when I heard about, you know, when I got, you know, offered to play basketball, all I could think about is making my father proud and not only, you know, watching games with him, but now playing and him being proud of me playing the game. So needless to say, I took took that invitation to play to play basketball. But um, I was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> by, eight, by the eighth grade, everyone knew the fundamentals of the game and knew how to shoot, pass, and dribble. And I didn't know anything other than the jump ball. That was my favorite part of the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I enjoyed when my father watched the jump ball. That was the, like the most fascinating part of the game to me is watching the jump ball. So that's all I really knew. Uh, in the eighth grade, um, but I went out for the team, and because I was tall, the tallest girl on the team, right. um, I really fell in love with playing defense. That was the only thing I really could do well because I knew how to block shots, and I knew how to prevent people from scoring. I didn't oh, know how to go. dribble. I didn't know how to pass. <laughs> I didn't know how to shoot. And a funny story is one: I was playing one in a game, and I got a steal. I don't know how I got a steal. <laughs> And I'm at the top of the key and I'm dribbling the ball and I've got everybody beat. And I'm so slow and I'm looking at my dad and smiling. <laughs> the next thing I know, the entire team catches up to me and like, I don't know what happened. I lost him. But that was when I realized that I have to take this a little bit more seriously <laughs> if I'm going to play because it's not, you know, about, you know, hey, dad, I'm playing basketball. It's something right. that I really got to invest the time and the energy and the effort into learning how to be a good basketball player. And uh, that's how it started. That's how I was introduced to the game of basketball. And since eighth grade, I've been playing ever since, you know. At what point did you now, like Dania, realize, like, I'm actually talented. Like, I can do this. I can take it somewhere. (laughs) Um, Like I said, I got really serious after that ball was stolen from me that day. day. (laughs) (laughs) Just off, And I said, it'll never happen again. I'll never never smile at the audience again while I'm here. You embarrassed me uh, once. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was it was funny because the same coach that I had in eighth grade, she all right after that season, she got offered the high school job. Okay. Um, and it wasn't in my neighborhood, but it was in another neighborhood. She got offered the high school job, and she said, "Hey, Daniel, you know you you know why don't you come to this high school with me and play for me?" And it was funny because the area that I grew up in was all black. It was an all black area in Brooklyn, New York, but the school was in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, which was an all white area. Right. And I didn't know how that would be for me transitioning to being in my neighborhood to now going to high school outside of my neighborhood in a white community. But needless to say, I went there simply because of my coach, Kathy, and for the opportunity to play basketball. And I didn't care about being a minority. I just wanted to play the game and I wanted to learn from her. She was my real teacher. Nice. other games of basketball besides my dad so I said wherever you go coach I'm going so 
I went to Bishop Carney High School, played four years there, and uh, we were pretty good. We were very successful um, during during my four years there. I was obviously always the tallest, but I learned the game of basketball and I learned, um, you know, how to shoot, how to dribble, how to pass, how to really um, excel in the game. And I think my height really helped. Uh, mm-hmm. And from there, I was recruited to play at Georgetown. And I didn't know, I mean, Georgetown obviously was my first choice because of my dad and obviously watching yeah. the play all along. <laughs> Um, I didn't realize how I, how good I was, but I think I was recruited because um, I was tall and I played defense so well. That was right. what I the, the most pride in, just defending. Because the other stuff took me a little longer to learn, but mm-hmm. uh, I knew I was a very, very good defender. And I led the league in block shots. And, you know, that's when I really knew that I had a, a niche. I had a talent for the game that probably could take me take me far. Absolutely. Can yeah. I ask how tall you are? Yeah. Uh, well, it's I'm killing me. Five, I'm only five eleven. But that's back, tall for a female. The, yeah. Back in the day, yeah. that that was a center spot. Now it's not. Now it's a wing. That's true. Position. But yeah. back uh, back then, um, in the in the early '90s, it was it was I was tall. I was considered one of the tall ones. So, yeah. So, so I'm curious, playing um, in Georgetown. Mm-hmm. Did the women's basketball team have as much respect on campus and at games than the uh, than the men? No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. No one could ever um, match that legacy that John Thompson brought to um, Georgetown and men's basketball. Yeah. Period. Really? Um, he was an icon then. Uh, he was, you know, the teams were very, very successful. They were treated like a professional team. They were in their own little bubble on campus, yeah. believe it or not. They were, um, you know, they had their own meal times. They had their own, um, you know, obviously their own study times. They had their own little academic situation set up. That We rarely saw the guys on campus, except for maybe weekends or stuff we'd hang out. But they really were kept separate, sep- separated from the rest of the student body. And I think because John Thompson knew that he had the responsibility of taking care of these 12 to 15 black guys who were at Georgetown University as a minority and probably majority of people didn't think they belonged there. So he had to make sure he kept them focused and that meant kept it, keeping them separated from any distraction that might you know, bring any attention to the program or the fact that a lot of people didn't even think they belonged. So that being said, obviously John Thompson has, has had a lot of success being a men's basketball coach and the women's team, you know, we were, you know, we were decent. We actually, my sophomore year was when we really started to put, you know, kind of put a name to the women's basketball program. We made it to the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament my sophomore year. Oh. And um, that was pretty much the early success of for women's basketball at Georgetown. And since then, they've had some NCAA runs. But my sophomore year was probably the best year for the program. And the first year that the program has made it national. Nation, made us nationally known, known as outside of the men's program. So what do you think, in your opinion, um, could be done differently for women's sports to be more recognized today? Um, I think lately, I mean, obviously I've been involved with women's basketball for t- the last 23 years, and it's improved tremendously. And yes, we do have a long way to go. There's still some parity that, you know, needs to, we need to make sure that, you know, we, that, you know, needs to become equal. There are still... Um, you know, and it's little things, it's, but it's the little things that mean a lot to the women that play the game. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It may not mean a lot to, you know, the fans like, you know, proper practice times that are equal. So we're not going either early in the morning or late at night because the men have the ideal slot, you know, how we yeah. travel, you know, the men are taking chartered flights, you know, we're taking commercial flights, um, gear, you know, men have unlimited gear. We have limited because we have a budget that we have to try to stay within it. Whereas the men sometimes don't have that budget because they're generating fans. They're, they're one of the money makers for the university. So it's subtle little things that may not mean a lot to the people on the outside, but to the girls we coach, it means the world. They want right. to know that they're treated as equal um, to the men, especially because they, they're friends with a lot of the men's men, guys on the men's team. So they hear some of the things that they get, some of the perks and some of the ways that they're treated that, you know, we're not. So you know, I think it's come a long way to answer your question, but I do think we have a long way to go. Um, I think even the way the WNBA is treated compared to the NBA. Yeah. I mean, that's just an example of some of the things that go on on the college level. Uh, I saw a tweet recently where someone said, you know, what a great night. 
NBA is playing, the and NFL is playing, the you know, um, the baseball league is playing, and they left out the WNBA, and you know they were playing. We, you know, we're in the playoffs. Yeah. So that's just you know we we have a long way to go. I mean, we we have to become, um, you know, respected with our with within the game. Um, I think Dawn Staley has done a great job in bringing you know, South Carolina to the forefront of women's basketball. Um, I think the w, the WNBA has been amazing with their play and how they play the game and, um, you know, the respect that the players gone or off the court. I think it's done, it's done tremendous for women's basketball, but I do think we still have a long, long way to go. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I grew up watching basketball. I mean, my whole life, I even played basketball, but never once did I ever turn on a WNBA game. Yes. Like, yes. I can't even lie. That's true. I never thought about it. It never crossed right. my mind because it was always NBA everywhere. Every channel, I would sit there on a Saturday afternoon or a night, and that was my weekend, just watching NBA games. And yeah. then fast forwarding, I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> there is actually a woman's league. Like, yeah. huh. it's, it's a beautiful game. It's a beautiful game to watch. I mean, I, I, I did some work with the Connecticut Sun, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before I was an advanced scout for them. And I would go out and watch the teams that they were going to play and kind of write up a scout report for them. Right. And, you know, I would attend some practices and some games, but it's, it's phenomenal to see them play. You know, the, the, the fundamental part of the game is not lost on the right. women's side. You know, the men's side is a lot of, you know, dunking and high flying and stuff, but the women's part of the game, it's X's and O's driven, it's discipline, it's fundamental. And it's probably the, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful game. So I would recommend that everybody take it, you know, stop and watch the WNBA game. They'll be very happy to, to watch, to see what's going on. If you love the game of basketball, you love watching the WNBA. Yeah. So how did you transition from a player to a, a coach? I think my experience as a player really um, motivated me to want to become a coach. Um, you know, I, I, I felt in college that I didn't have a great relationship with my coach. And I felt like um, he wasn't able to coach me the way I needed to be coached. I think he coached everyone the same. And I mm -hmm. felt like there were different people on the team with different personalities, with different backgrounds, with different skill set. And you kind of needed a coach to kind of understand that and kind of meet you where you are and bring you along. And I didn't feel like I had that in college. I struggled in college quite a bit on the court. And um, it was because I just didn't feel like I had anyone that could kind of help me go through what I was going through. And that actually motiv motivated me to be a coach because I wanted to prove that it could be done a better way. Right. And I wanted, to I wanted to be a player's coach. I wanted to be a coach that the young women could come to me with any issues, you know, because there's a lot that goes on off the court that affects your on-the-court performance. And unless you have a coach that understands that, it's very difficult to be successful. So I wanted to be a player's coach. And I obviously started coaching right when I graduated Georgetown. I was coaching right away. I was coaching at Long Island University as a graduate assistant coach. Right. And through my time, my early coaching career, I was the coach that all the girls came to with their off-the-court problems. Oh. You know? <laughs> And I felt good because I was helping them through it, which in turn helped them be better players because they, they, they were more focused on their game because they didn't have to worry about anything else that was going off the court. So that was the reason that really kept me motivated to become or to stay in coaching because I found my purpose was really to help them with life lessons and not only coach them through the game of basketball. And that really was why um, I you know, stayed in coaching because I didn't feel like I had that as a player in college. Right. Were you, while you were coaching, is that when you became uh, pregnant with Terrence? Uh, yes, it was, I graduated in 95 and I got pregnant with him in 96. So it was while I was a graduate assistant coach. Cause I went back to New York and my first job was at Long Island University in Brooklyn. And yep. And he pretty much, like I say, he grew up on the court. Like he was probably born, <laughs> I probably delivered him and then went right to work the next day. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I was fortunate to work for a head coach who had children. So she allowed me to keep him around. He went on road trips. Uh, he was always at practice, you know, whenever, you know, I would take him into the office and he'd be running around and it was normal. And not a lot of women had that opportunity. Not a lot of us are, could be in a workforce where our families are embraced and we're allowed to kind of, 
you know, uh, raise our family while being full time, while working full time. And, you know, coaching is more than full time. Yeah. It's a 24 seven job. And as a graduate assistant coach, not only was I responsible to coach, but I was also responsible for study hall, which was at, in the evenings. I was responsible for laundry, <laughs> you know, which I had to go in early to do. I was, you know, I had a lot of dirty jobs, you know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't high profile jobs. There were very jobs that I had to make sure that I did a lot behind the scenes. So Terrence was always there with me, you know, and he just wow. was born and raised in, in, in the gym and, be, you know, became, and I had Martin 21 months after Terrence. Okay. So I had both of my children around while being a, ba- a graduate assistant coach, then a restricted earnings coach, then an assistant coach. They were just always a part of my coaching experience. So with Terrence, Mm -hmm. at what age did you now realize like, hold on a second, my little boy, he's following my footsteps. He's got that, he's got that mama talent. (laughs) He's been (laughs) on the court. (laughs) Funny because obviously I have, like I said, I have two sons, Martin and Terrence. And during games, I would obviously take them on the road trips. So they'd be on the bus in the back of the bus with the girls that, you know, we'd be on the front of the bus going to the games. And as soon as we got to the games, now these are little kids, I would say, all right, you guys got to sit right here and don't move. Okay. Mama's going to be right there coaching (laughs) right here and don't move. Five minutes after the game starts, I turn, I look behind my shoulder. Martin is off running somewhere. He's at the concession stands. He's making friends. He's like all over the gym and Terrence is locked in. And when I tell you locked in, he's sitting behind us, told exactly where I told him to sit. And he's watching everything that's going on on the court. He's listening to every word that we we say in the timeout. He's soaking every bit of the game in. And that's when I knew he was special. Martin, on the other hand, was buying (laughs) uh, somebody on the other team ended up buying him pizza (laughs) because a homeless child, you know, yeah. <laughs> he's playing with all the other ki- any other children he could find in the gym. He's off playing with them. Terrence did not move till halftime. Wow. And that's when I knew he was definitely special in terms of the having the passion for the game and learning the game. He, he was more he learned the game from a coach's perspective before his skill set ever developed. Wow. You know, he would watch film with me at night. Because I, I obviously, as an assistant coach, I would do a lot of breakdowns. So when I came home from work, work I brought home work with me. I would have to, you know, cut up film and, you know, do all this. So he's up watching it with me. And I'm showing him w- what went wrong, what we have to do. Like, we're actually doing X's and O's after homework, you know. And Martin's nowhere to be found. Yeah. <laughs> so I watching TV. But uh, Terrence was always locked into the game from a, from a very, very young age. And that's when I knew he'd be special. In terms of his athletic ability, when I knew he was special in terms of his his gift, his skill set, was when he started dunking. Because as a female coach, I'd never have to I never had to teach dunking. Yeah. Like I could help him with his dribbling, his moves, and with his shooting, with his you know you know certain fundamentals of the game. But when he started actually dunking, I was like, well, you know what? That's that's above my pay scale. <laughs> How, how you did that or what you had to do to do that. So you might want to go, you know, yeah. get, tra- like get trained by a real trainer right now because I can't help you with that part of it. <laughs> well, as good as a mom that you're able to recognize that, you know what, I don't know this and he's good and I'm going to have to figure out a way to develop yeah. his his skills. Yeah. Right. Because you have a lot of moms that just are clueless. Yeah. Yeah. Like and even, even that being said, I, he still came to me for the majority of the aspects of the game, you but know, you're still mom. like, yeah, mom, you know, how do, how should I defend this? Or how should we do that? Or, you know, what about this move? Or what about that move? Like he still always came back to me for more of the, um, the mental part of the game, right. not the physical part anymore. I was more of, I became more of his mental coach through the game of basketball. Right. So he came to you with these questions as mom coach and not just yeah. mom. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Like it makes me wonder sometimes, like, hmm, what do our kids ask us these questions? If you yes. didn't have that basketball background, right? Yeah, yeah. They probably ask you to find someone to ask, to answer the question as opposed yeah. to like, I know a little bit about basketball. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think. I, I'm more of a of a um, support system to him right now, really with the mental part of the game of basketball. 
it seems like it's such a big difference between um, gender when you're looking at being a male basketball coach versus a woman basketball coach. I mean, yeah. I don't want to, you know, to be gender block here, but it just seems like, wow, as a mom, you're still a mom. Still you still got to look after your babies and you still have to do all these things. And if you want a career while doing this, you still got to go home, do the homework and cook and clean. Not to yeah. say that men don't do it, but I personally find there's just a big, vast difference. Definitely. So was that difficult for you to pull all that together? It became easier uh, as I became a head coach because I could arrange my practice schedule around my kids a little bit yeah. easier. And I could come in pretty much when I wanted to and leave when I wanted to. But as an assistant, you really don't have that option. Right. So being a head coach uh, really allowed me to kind of be with them a lot more uh, than I was when I was an assistant coach. But that being said, as a head coach, there's so much more responsibility right. and pressure. So I brought all that responsibility and pressure home. Yeah. So I was home more, but my mind wasn't there. I was more right. thinking about my players, thinking about the next game, thinking about the, the practice for the next day. Like there was just so many things as a head coach that you take home with you. Um, even when you are home, you still are thinking about your program 24 seven. I find in a lot of careers, um, as moms, right? Like Stephanie, you have two little kids, right? So, well, you have three children, but I mean, two that are little that require so much attention. So, yeah. I mean, we understand what it's like when we got to come home, home, like you're saying, and do all these things and be mom, but yet still be boss of whatever we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that was challenging. It's, I think it's incredibly challenging, but I always talk about this with my husband because I don't think that he quite grasps the fact that no matter what, when I'm at work, I want to be home. And when I'm at home, my head's at work. Yes. And the more powerful position you're in or important your role is in your job, that that only becomes more stressful. It doesn't change or get easier at any point. You know, I'm dropping my kids off at the bus at 8 a.m. and then 8.05, I'm in the car and I'm on a conference call already, wiping tears away because I just put my baby boy on the bus. <laughs> That's Still right. got to be strong, eh? Oh, for sure. I cried five times this week. Maybe more. I cried when somebody else's kid was crying at the school. <laughs> My husband was like, all right, this is enough. You know? And I've missed a lot of big moments, you know. And the last big moment I missed was his, uh, se his uh, senior night from Florida State. And my mom and my dad and his dad were there to kind of, you know, walk him out. Uh, at Florida State and I wasn't because we had a game and that was the last the last thing I said I would miss because after that obviously I stopped coaching mm -hmm. and I've been with him every step of the way all through the pre-draft all through the drafting the draft process you know anytime I could get to LA to watch him play if I you know if he was down in Philly I went to Philly and even being in the bubble now you know I would never have the opportunity to be here present right and present for him if I was still coaching. So God has, God knows what he was doing. He said, all right, Daniel, that's enough. Now it's time to kind of yeah. really, really be about Yeah. So yeah. I, I thank God every day that I'm not coaching uh, women's basketball right now because I'm, you know, doing exactly what I need to do right now in my life. And that's to be there with him. It seems as moms, we always have to make that sacrifice. Always. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it just, for us is like, why do we have to make the choice between the kids and the yeah. career? And it doesn't get easy, you know, it doesn't get easy as we, no matter what age, no matter what age, it doesn't get it get easy at all. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry Stephanie. <laughs> I know. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and I thought like even owning my own business, that was sort of why I started it with the thought that I would have easier hours. So I'd left my job about two years ago and started my company. And from there it got way worse. <laughs> so, well, you know, it, it, it's nice to be self-employed and whatnot, but the pressure that you bring home, just like you said, Every yeah. problem I have with a client, it comes home and I think about it all night. I lose sleep over it. And then when I drop my babies off at school, I take that to work, think about his, his face crying. You know, it's, it's a mixed bag of emotions all day, every day. But you know and what the blessing is? The chill, our kids see our strength. Yeah. And that's one thing they, they take on and they, 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 under, they, they, they appreciate everything that we are and how strong we are. And they take on those intangibles in their lives. So you're a great role model. We're great role models for them, I think, being strong and being able to do everything that we do and do it well. So that's that's the, that's the best part of it. I appreciate that spin yeah. on it for sure. <laughs> it was a rough week. Um, 
Can I backtrack a little bit? I have a question that's sure. like been driving me crazy since you started. You touched on uh, sort of your own career starting out when you went to high school and you were you decided to follow a coach and you were the minority at that school. So my husband's from Africa. He's a big seven footer. We've got a four year old who's sorry, one that just turned four last month and one that'll be five next month. They're wow. only 10 months apart. So yeah. our daughter's the one that's turning five in October and she's a full head taller than every kid in her class. She's faster than all the boys yeah. and she's competitive, like beyond belief. Nice. But we've can put I her. Can I recruit her now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> I so, out. Yeah, she's in a, in a predominantly white school. There's maybe maybe 10, 10 other black kids, but the education at the school is second to none. So we've sort of made that sacrifice to set her up with the right foundation. Right. But the sports component leaves a lot to be desired. Mm-hmm. How how did you find that being in a predominantly white school? How did that affect the sports aspect for you? Yeah, I, I think we were in a great basketball league when I was in high school. So our league was pretty diverse. So I was able to, um, you know, kind of um, get different uh, play from every from every team that we, we we went to. But I think high school and for, for me, we also had AAU. And AAU now you're traveling across the country and playing, you know, a lot of in a lot of AAU programs against a lot of different teams from a lot of different places. So that's really where I got a lot of the diversity from in the sport was with AAU. So if there is um, any other uh, leagues for her age outside of the school, I would definitely have her involved in those as well. That makes a lot of sense because I actually don't want to sacrifice the education yeah. component where yeah. it is it's. Like it's, it's really next level what she's getting yeah. Yeah. for, you know, for basketball, if we can find some alternatives. So yeah. I guess I obviously knew about AU, but it uh, hadn't crossed my mind. I was yeah. pressuring the school so much to uh, just be better at basketball. Yeah. No, yeah, they, I think that would be a great, great um, addition to what she's also getting at, with her school, as, especially as she gets older, you know, find a very competitive AU program that travels and she could just, just play with different teams from all across the country. Introduce yeah. her to Auntie Dania. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're going to have to do, Stephanie. We're going to follow you on everything. Yeah, after. yeah, yeah. Deja, Dania. <laughs> Make her follow her. <laughs> yeah. This is your auntie and follow her. That's it. So. <laughs> no questions. So Terrence played um, at Florida State. And he played uh, with Dwayne Bacon and um, Malik Beasley, whose moms we actually had on the show, too. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. (laughs) You know, for you, I I just I just love this because you look at the game from a different eye than a lot of the a lot of the moms um, that we've interviewed. And just a lot of just as a a woman in general, because you are a coach. So, you Mm -hmm. know, the difference. So with you watching him play or then did you think he was ready for the NBA? I was very critical of his game, <laughs> which probably Amen. is the coach side of, of me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would, uh, I would wa- watch his game, and I would always find the things that he did wrong, because I understood right. what the game plan was. I understood what he was supposed to do when he didn't do it. So I'd say, oh, you know, he, I'd call and speak to him after game games. Oh, yeah, you were great. You had to, but you missed that box out. <laughs> And why did you miss that free throw? And oh, he was like, Ma, I was like, I know, but you know, when you're coming off that ball screen, you got to come tight. You come, you came wide, you allowed the defender to cut through. That's why you st- you lost the ball. So I was always critical of his game because whenever I watch basketball, I'm I'm watching it from a coach's perspective. That's right. And I'm always picking out, even when I watch the Clippers play, I'm always picking out the things that were not done well enough, you know, yeah. <laughs> in a possession. Or for whatever. So he had to kind of deal with that, which probably is unfortunate for him. <laughs> because uh, I wasn't the cheerleader and I wasn't the, oh, you were great. Oh, you had 15 points. That's awesome. I would be like, you had 15 points for four turnovers. Now let's talk about <laughs> why did you try to pass the ball that you should have shot it when you didn't pass it. So uh, I think he, he would probably be like, oh, she was so critical of my game, but it kept him, it kept him. I think it it, not only did it keep him on point because he knew I was watching, but it also increased his basketball IQ because we would yeah. always talk about the things that he didn't do well. So not only would he get 
coaching from his coaches, but he also got it from mom when we spoke, you know, right. and there was mom proud. Yeah. Then there were times <laughs> where I, you know, knew not to yeah. bring up the game and kind of gave him an, an opportunity to vent. And then there were times where I had to say, no, 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 that's not what I saw. And then I said, and that's why your coaches did this. So that's why this happened. So I think that perspective kind of just helped him understand the overall, the game, the X's yeah. and O's, the IQ of the game of basketball. Cause it's not all about performance. There's so many little things that go into it that, uh, you know, if you're not focusing on the details, you, you know, you kind of lose your opportunity. And that's why he does, he does, I think as a player, he does a little bit of everything. Like he'll re he'll he'll rebound because he understands the importance of rebounding on both ends of the floor. Right. He'll assist because he understands the importance of making a great play instead of a good play. Like you know he'll you know he'll he'll he he just does a little bit. Of, he'll dive on the floor for loose balls because he understands how important that possession is. Right. Like there's just a certain part of his game that I see my teaching in. Right. It, you know all those things that I've taught him. I could see it when he plays because a lot of players especially in the NBA I think they're so talented they could get away with not doing the little things yeah <laughs> or 25 30 points you know what I right, mean right whereas Terrence you he'll probably won't give you that volume scoring but he'll give you all the little things to fill up the stat sheet that right. probably go unnoticed you know and that's what I'm most proud of I don't really look at his points at all I look at his assist and his rebounding those right. are the two things that I really really that determines whether he in my 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 opinion, whether he has a good game or a bad game. So college and NBA are two different things. Um, for Terrence, how did he get mentally prepared to play at a different level? Uh, it's different. It's definitely different from college. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think in college, I wouldn't say he played more and that was a difference. I think just the, the, the pressure and the level mm -hmm. of... Um, I mean, this is the National Basketball Association. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody's watching, you know, yeah. and the fans are very critical of yeah. players and the coaches. Where yep. at college, you don't get that as much. You know, you get your fan base, obviously. And, you know, there are people out there that, but not, you know, I think there are more people that follow NBA basketball than college basketball. And I think the level that you go, the level, mm -hmm. the, 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 the audience that you play in front of in college is way different than in NBA. And I think that adds a different level of um, pressure and, 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 and just not, you know, stress, but it puts you on a whole, puts you on a national stage. So the kind of things you got away with in college, you can, probably can't get away with in playing in the NBA. And he had to learn, he had to learn, right. you know, and, and when you do have bad games or, you know, everybody's on Twitter talking about you, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to learn to kind of separate that from, yeah. your, from your mental approach and, and kind of, you know, put it aside. But with social, social media, these guys are under constant scrutiny for every little thing. Right. Yeah. And you don't have yeah. that knowledge. So your, yeah. your, your um, pursuit to be perfect, I think in the, in the NBA is way different than it is college in college. You can make your mistakes and play through it. But I think in the NBA, they're all trying to be perfect in their game because they know the level of scrutiny, scrutiny that they're under. We want to know what's going on in the bubble. Oh, the bubble. <laughs> I'm in my hotel room, as you can see. This is my yeah. bathroom. That was the cutest one I could find for you guys. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I tried the drapes, and the drapes are horrendous. <laughs> it's horrendous. I, it was, this is all I got for you. That's all right. That's but, all right. Uh, it's, it's, personally, I think it's cool because I don't know how often these guys get to interact. Right outside of a competitive environment, right. you know? And I'm not saying, you know, they're all hanging out with each other, but just to walk down the hall and see one another and give that kind of respect, you know, like, you know, hey, how you doing? And, and seeing someone that you probably never knew, but you see them as a real person now, yeah. I think for them that might, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just for me looking at it. They probably could care less who they <laughs> see, but I think for me, it's cool. It's cool for them to see one another as actual people as actual black men as actual fathers mm -hmm. as actual you know because you know they don't get a chance to see that when they're just playing each other right. now the families are here the kids are here um the wives are here so they actually see them as family men you know this you know it was so cute um when we were first allowed to come into the bubble a little boy i forget he may have been two years old 
and he saw his dad for the first time mm-hmm. and he's like running like he could barely run but he's running and his hands are out and his Aww. dad running to him like those moments like that was just so touching to me I, i'm more mm-hmm. i guess that's the emotional side to me i'm looking of at the bubble emotional perspective but i just think for them for them to just be able to um have other people witness them not only as basketball players right. but also as fathers as husbands you know as just a real person like just walking going to the cafeteria getting food you know it's just it, for me it provides a different perspective to who they really are and yeah. um i'm glad they get to do it together you know they're all going through the same thing um they're all in here can't go out you know not much that they can do but yet they're all in it together so that camaraderie i think I hope it uh, continues to exist in the league. I think it's necessary. So what has Terrence been doing during this whole quarantine period? What does he do to keep busy? Uh, um, uh, not much, not much, because they're all, I think he, you know, he said something to me that I was like, yeah, you're right. He said, mom, I'm not here. This is not my vacation. This is my job. Yeah. Cause I was you're like, right. let's go by the pool. He's like, mom, I'm not on vacation. This is my job. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'll be at the pool. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> And I think a lot of them are taking that approach. A lot of them are either preparing for practice or preparing for the game. There's no in-between. Like the in-between for them doesn't exist. And mm-hmm. I know how that is because as a coach, it was always either game day or two two days before the game or three days before. Like you always thought about right. time based yep, yep. on that. So they're doing the same thing here. They're not, you know, they're not out. It's really deserted if you, in in the bubble where everyone could walk around is not a lot of people at all. These right. guys are, you know, either going to get food or going back to their room or whatever. You'll see them when they're coming in and out from games and stuff. And you might see a few of them walking out with their families every now and then, but it's not like everyone's just hanging out. And, you know, it's not like that at all. These guys are taking this very, very serious. They all obviously want to win the championship and they know that, um, you know, they got to stay locked in and focused. Right. Um, and I think they're all doing that very well. What is life after basketball in your mind? Yeah. Look for Terrence. I mean, he's he's like you said, he's the rookie now. He's just starting. He he could be there and for another ten years. But yeah, that's it. Amen. But my question is, what do you think life would after basketball would be for him? Like, for example, if you were head coach of a team, would you hire him as your assistant? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. But I hope and I pray that he becomes an NBA head coach one day. Yeah. I think he's got a great uh, basketball IQ. I think he understands coaching very well. And obviously he's had a great playing career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it goes, you know, however long it goes, uh, I think he's done enough throughout his playing career to, to have a solid um, reputation for being a, a good player. You know, uh, I would love to see him on the sidelines one day. That would be my joy to see him on the sidelines coaching one day. And also commentating. I think he, 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 you know, he's very articulate. You know, I think even doing that would be great too. But I hope one day he'll be coaching. I would love to see that. Yeah. I just have to ask about his cooking. Man <laughs> versus food. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that Rasta Pasta video. So <laughs> That came out of nowhere. It was, it, it, I don't know where that came from. I, I, di- I didn't know my son as, as loving, cook, loving to cook. I'll tell you that. However, during the pandemic, it was just nothing going on. Yeah. And they had to find something to keep the rookies busy because they, you know, he's all the way out in LA. He has no family, you know, whereas most of the other guys had their wives and their, right. you know, their family closer where they could kind of um, stay busy, but not for the rookies. So his agent thought about this. He said, you know, well, what, what, what would you like to do? And he was like, mm, maybe cook. And they put it all together for him. I sent him a couple of recipes um yes he gave you props i gave him yeah yeah i gave him a couple of recipes and you know we're from the caribbean we're from saint lucia saint lucia so we yeah. have yep yeah, we have a lot of the the you know the curry and the jerk spices yep. and you know all that stuff um and he, he you know him being alone um in la he you know he, he was telling me mom i need to cook what should i cook tonight so you know that he just wanted to learn how to cook because i think he was by himself in la right and he oh. can't afford a chef yet he's not it's yeah not, he's not there yet <laughs> So he had to learn how to cook. And I think the, they just asked him, what do you want to do you know, during the pandemic? And he's like, well, maybe a cooking show. So it all yeah. kind of fell together. 
his show fooled me completely because he didn't use any measuring uh, devices whatsoever. So I thought, like, this guy's been cooking his whole life. Yeah. <laughs> what is, it was a word he, a little bit of this. Or a yeah. Of- yep, yep. Just pour it in. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> he gave you props. He did use one ingredient, and I was like, where did you get that from? I never use that. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I don't know, but I like it. I'm like, Okay. Yeah, he was like, you have to chop the vegetables, and he had them all nicely chopped. And he was like, yeah, you have to sprinkle it on the chicken. I was like, wow. So then, and then he says, my mom uses drumsticks, but I use chicken breast. It was awesome. Look at you. See? We think that our, our boys, our kids don't listen to us or watch us, and they do pay attention. So he was. I was telling Stephanie earlier, they're watching you. Yeah. They're watching your resolve. They're watching yeah. everything. So. You don't, you don't think so, but they, they, they're watching. <laughs> my, one of my last questions I want to ask is, um, so he went to school in New Hampshire, then Florida State. Um, now he's in California. I mean, these are three vastly different communities. Like, did he, did he have a, an issue um, adjusting to one over the other? Uh, no, I, and I think it's because he had been in prep school and away from home since the seventh grade. So going mm-hmm. off to college wasn't a big thing, you know, cause he right. was, had been gone from home since seventh grade. Uh, what did surprise me in choosing Florida state? I mean, I, we obviously chose, chose Florida state because of Lennon Hamilton and his coaching staff. I think it was just for me, I wanted him to play for someone that would mentor him and be, you know, treat him treat him uh, more than just a basketball player. And I thought Coach Hamilton has such a, a reputation of being more than that to his guys. So that was important. But he wanted to go where it was warm. I think he had had enough of New, Ham- of New Hampshire and the cold and the snow. <laughs> he said, Mom, I just want to go anywhere warm. I, I just don't like the cold anymore. So that was kind of surprising that he, you know, he wanted to look for schools that were in the South. Well, thank God the Bulls didn't choose him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They'd be freezing. So- <laughs> He's yeah, he's loving the loving the, the warm. And you know, I, I said I said to him all the time, I'm like, it's so hot outside. No one's ever outside. Everyone's inside in the in the air condition in the AC. Yeah, like no one's walking the streets outside. It's so hot. <laughs> They're either in their, in their car or at the house. So I said you want the warmth, but you're always inside. And it's always That's freezing. True. It's always freezing when you're inside. Oh, at least they have the option. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's about, mom. It's yeah. options. I know. So, yeah, he chose, he wanted to go down south. That was what surprised me about his college choice. How yeah. far from home was the uh, seventh grade prep school? I'm already freaking half out. Hour. It was half an hour. It was half an hour. Oh, okay. oh. Yes. <laughs> I could do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was half an hour. And, uh, yeah, it was, he got to come, he got to come home sometimes. On weekends, he would come home sometimes. Um, and then I think eighth grade, his brother also attended the school. So they were both there together oh. for his, his eighth and eighth and ninth grade. So they were together in prep school. And that, I think, helped. Yeah. So as a coach and as a mom, my last question to you is, what advice would you give to an amateur basketball player? Ooh, an amateur basketball player. Yep, someone that just says, you know what, my dream is to play for the league. Mm-hmm. But you, as a parent who are you're a coach, first of all, so you have a different insight. Mm-hmm. But as well as you know, you're a mom, so you see both both sides. So, what mm-hmm. advice does someone say to you? Listen, I need to get to the league. What, what do I do, Miss Dania? <laughs> I, I think the most important thing is to develop your mental approach to the game as well as your physical approach to the game. Because there are a lot of highs and lows in the game of basketball. And unless you can control them and overcome them, you're going to have more lows than you are going to have highs. Mm -hmm. So to any parent out there, I would definitely encourage them to talk to their children about the game of basketball and encourage them to fight the adversity. You know, don't be so concerned about missing shots. Don't be so concerned about losing. You know, find a way to always get better based on what you go through on the court. And have it be life lessons. I just, just think that's very important. And there are so many talented players out there that don't have the mental capacity to lose with disappoint, to deal with disappointment. Yeah. And I think they don't have long careers because of it, or they don't enjoy the game because of it. You know. So I think just definitely developing your mental side and your mental approach to the game, as well as the physical approach, is uh, advice that I would give any amateur player, any parent of an amateur player. 
um, you know, just or any player that's just not happy with the game because they're so concerned about the physical part. The mental approach is so very important. That is awesome advice. Dania, thank you so, so you much. I listen, this to me, this episode is just different than what we normally do because the moms, none of them are coaches or the ones that we've interviewed so far, right. they're not coaches. So it's 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 nice to hear a different perspective and see a different insight as you know what I mean. You yeah, you yeah. actually understand the game at a different level and 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 just you know what I mean and and being able to to show this to your son yeah. and and look at him now. He's he he's he's excelling. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was so very good to meet you guys. I've obviously been following you guys a lot. <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I want to get on that show. <laughs> When you call, I was like, "Yay!" Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, you so doing much. What thank you for doing what you're doing too. I think it's a great platform, and it helps a lot of people, a lot of moms out there. So, kudos to you guys too. Thank you. Our goal is to let everybody understand who the players are, like you said earlier, as people. Yes. Right. People have that misconception, you know what I mean, as players, and a lot of it is is it true so yes. we just want to get the word out there saying they're human like all of us like we're all the only difference is the bank account sometimes yeah. so that's <laughs> it <laughs> sometimes yeah. and that's it but they're people yeah. so thank you so much for coming on courtside moms and yeah. keep in touch thank you i will well, thank you well, stephanie will be calling you oh. because yeah 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 <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <for us>. <laughs> auntie <laughs> dania <laughs> Send in that national letter of intent to your daughter tomorrow. We yeah, have yeah. Sign me with that size and that basketball pedigree. I want to coach yeah. her. She's like, she needs 11 years. So, <laughs> no, I'll send her. I'll send her. All right. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. She'll be the little rookie catching it, getting the water for everybody she's, from now. She's got to work on that, uh, the emotional component. She, yeah. she even cries when she wins at this Aww. point. It, it's not enough. <laughs> yeah, she's competitive beyond belief. That's wow, that's we're gonna work on that though. She's gonna rule the world. Just have a little fun. <laughs> maybe, maybe she'll be your assistant coach. <laughs> she'll be tech. She'll have two techs and be gone right away. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> From the bench. <laughs> we're like, wow, she lasted four minutes. <laughs> that's okay, Dania. We'll we'll take care of her. She'll be in good hands, Stephanie. Don't worry. <laughs> but Dania, thank you so much, and keep in touch. I will definitely. All right, All right be blessed. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.